We loved the Nintendo 64 and its pool of high quality exclusives, but not everyone did. Even in its heyday, the system was seen as a misstep by many and was the beginning of the Nintendo mentality. Many developers shifted away from Nintendo and moved instead onto Sony's newest competitor, the PlayStation. This was primarily because Sony's system was substantially easier to work with and its disc-based games were much cheaper to produce. The PS1 was also seen as more mature, catering to an adult audience who had disposable income, with Sony being more comfortable with adult content like blood or violence in their games. That isn't to say that the Nintendo 64 didn't have some incredible games, but it was definitely a period when Nintendo were not leading the industry in sales or user mindshare. However, one area Nintendo excelled at in this era was gameplay innovation, and the games they released for the N64 almost always set the benchmark of quality in their respective genres. High-octane racing games like F-Zero X and 1080 Snowboarding, the birth of 3D platforming in Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie, epic adventures like Ocarina of Time, party time classics like Mario Party 2 or Smash Bros, and even film tie-ins like Star Wars Racer or Rogue Squadron can all be found on the system, and we'll be talking about many of these games in today's episode. We'll start with arguably the most extreme of these games and hit the dusty slopes of 1080 Snowboarding, Nintendo's answer to the SSX franchise. 1080 Snowboarding has its fair share of cameo appearances, not that surprising for a Nintendo game. The Big N wanted to include some of their iconic characters within the game's tundra, and as such, added their iconic mascots, Mario and Luigi, among the crowd of spectators within the game. Mario and Luigi can be seen in a fairly realistic depiction, donning their signature colored overalls. They are so incredibly well hidden. A perhaps lesser-known character from Nintendo's history also makes an appearance on the Golden Forest track, though this is incredibly easy to miss. Hidden off to one side, watching the player cruise down the mountain, is a man donning what can either be some fishing or hunting gear alongside his canine companion. This same graphic makes an appearance in Wave Race 64. These cameos are so incredibly well hidden, it's almost surprising anybody actually wound up noticing them at all. Another well-hidden secret can be found stored away in the data of Super Mario 64. Before the release of the final game, a demonstration was made playable at the Shoshinkai 1995 trade show, an event that had later be renamed Nintendo Space World. Nintendo clearly created a simple level select menu for this event, made ready only a month before the show took place. Normally, data created for the sole purpose of a demo wouldn't be found in the final retail build of a title, but located at the start of the game's text data in all localized versions of the game are the remains of this basic level select. This is a separate level select from a fully functional one created for the purpose of the developers debugging the game, with the levels not having their final names, and instead using much earlier ones. These are Mountain, which became Womp's Fortress, Fire Bubble, which became Lethal Lava Land, Snow Slider, which became Cool Cool Mountain, Waterland, which became Dire Dire Docks, and Koopa No. 1, which became Bowser in the Dark World. We'll get to more N64 games shortly, but first, a word from our sponsor, Idol Slayer. Idol Slayer is an incremental game where you must slay monsters and keep your people safe from the darkness, all of which unfolds through the game's cutscenes. The game has addictive and deep gameplay, and can not only be played on Android, iOS, and Steam, but also has cross-platform cloud saving between PC and mobile, so you can keep playing on the same save file at home or on the go. Idol Slayer has been downloaded over 2 million times, and is constantly updated, with some epic boss fights currently in development. It also has no forced ads, and is free to play on every platform, and has some fun random minigames thrown in. The game is available in 27 languages, has over 500 achievements, 700 upgrades, 100 quests, and over 10 characters to unlock, all with huge skill trees to explore. This is all the more impressive due to the game being made by a single developer. To try out Idle Slayer right now for free, check out the link in this video's description. And now, back to the N64 trivia. The N64 also had some top-notch third-party titles. The Star Wars video games aren't by any means a bad bunch, with titles like Episode 1 Racer being fondly remembered. But the game wasn't always going to simply be called Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, but rather Star Wars Episode 1 Pod Racer as would be a much more fitting title. However, it was unfortunate that there was already another sci-fi racing game out at the same time for Windows PCs published by Ubisoft, called Planet of Death. 
which was abbreviated to POD for the North American market. With this, Ubisoft had actually trademarked the word pod in any form of interactive entertainment, so the team behind Episode 1 Racer decided to play it safe and turn Episode 1 Pod Racer to just Episode 1 Racer. Another Star Wars title on the Nintendo 64 was Rogue Squadron, which released before the film's Episode 1 prequel, but this didn't stop the team from inserting some secrets that wouldn't be seen by players and even a good chunk of the game's development staff until after The Phantom Menace's release. By entering the password Halifax question mark and then exclamation mark Ingve exclamation mark while also ignoring the incorrect password entry noises, it's possible to unlock and play as a Naboo starfighter from The Phantom Menace. Having been published six months before the prequel, the code had to be kept secret, only being revealed to the public after the film was released. As for the second code of this unlockable, Ingve, this was taken from the Swedish musician Ingve Malmsteen. If anybody knows why this is, however, we're all is, as this seems like a, a, an entirely random choice. From pod racing to a different kind of futuristic racing, it's time to talk about F-Zero X. The Giga Leak of 2020 revealed a whole lot of weird data for a good bundle of Nintendo games, but one of the things revealed from this leak is related to F-Zero X. Two pictures can be found within a set of early graphics for the title, which seem entirely unrelated to Nintendo, never mind the F-Zero series. The first of these images is of Beavis from the animated show Beavis and Butthead, specifically the head of a 1998 more action collectibles toy of the character. The second image is simply the same as the first one, slightly enlarged, and with its colors inverted, because if anything is going to scream the 90s at you, it's not only Beavis and Butthead, but also an image that uses the fancy new visual effect of inverted colors. But even the final build of F-Zero X has a hidden secret within its data that can be used with the help of an additional piece of hardware, a DYKG favorite, the Nintendo 64 DD Expansion Kit. By attaching this expansion to the N64 console and playing F-Zero X, a completely unique musical track will play on the Rainbow Road level. This is a specially composed alternative arrangement of the Mario Kart 64 Rainbow Road theme. Glorious. Now this next piece is so quintessentially British that it couldn't come from anywhere but rare. Gruntilda is the primary antagonist of the Banjo-Kazooie series, but the origin of her full name may escape many. Gruntilda Winky Bunyan. The Gruntilda portion comes from the series composer Grant Kirkhope, who would sometimes be referred to as Grunt instead of Grant. Simply slapping a tilde on the end for a more feminine name makes sense. As for Winky Bunyan, a surname that is only revealed during the boss fight in Banjo-Tooie, some Brits may have already clocked the name. This name is based on British slang for both a penis and a wart, respectively. Winky and Bunyan. Despite this fact, however, the game was still given an E rating by the ESRB, perhaps having missed the rather crass reference. Rare seemed to enjoy the term Winky around the office, as they would even sometimes refer to Steve Malus as Winky Boy. Another secret nod to the team can be found in Banjo-Tooie, where the combination code to obtain the Jiggy belonging to Super Stash the Safe in Cloud Cuckoo Land's Central Cave is 1984, a number which the safe describes as a rare date. This is indeed a rare date, and references the year Rare as a Company was founded, 1984. Mario Party 2 has a huge number of references to not just pop culture, but even real-life culture sprinkled throughout. If the player refuses Wiggler's Hootenanny offer, she will say, Y'all come back now, ya hear? A much-quoted line originally delivered by Jed Clampett in the TV series The Beverly Hillbillies. Service Bell, take your shoes off. I'll come back now, here. Woody the Tree's Japanese name is also a reference, being Kinokyo, originating from the word ki, meaning tree, and Pinocchio, the famous story of a living wooden boy. This isn't the only famous old story referenced, such as with the Japanese name for the skeleton ki, where it is called Akazuki-chan, which effectively translates into Little Ki Riding Hood. Akazu, meaning do not open, ki, meaning, well, ki, and Akazukin, meeting Little Red Riding Hood. 
In terms of references to the real world, the menu icon for the Mystery Land board seems to resemble the Condor figure found at the Nazca Lines, a collection of ancient geoglyphs carved into the soil of the Nazca Desert, located in southern Peru. The Boo Bell may also be a reference to the practice of burying the dead with a bell tied to a piece of string, which would be tied to the cadaver with the bell kept above ground. This was so that if somebody was buried alive, they'd be able to ring the bell, and the gravekeeper would have been able to set them free. And of course, another N64 classic is Super Smash Brothers. Goddamn, Smash is amazing, and nobody would have guessed how big this franchise would have become based on this first title. This initial entry into the franchise crossover series established Mario's fighting moveset, including a variety of special moves. These moves are based on the Shoto style of fighting game character, the general all-rounder, but more specifically than that, his primary selection of special moves are all in reference to Ryu from Street Fighter. Mario's attacks mirror those of Ryu, such as his Hadouken-like fireball attack with his neutral special, a jumping uppercut similar to Shoryuken in his up special, or a spinning tackle similar to Ryu's Tatsumaki Senpukyaku in his down special, the Mario Tornado. Mario's moves would evolve and adapt to be less Shoto-esque as the Smash game franchise went on, but alongside this, Ryu himself would also go on to be added into the Smash series, making his debut in Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS and Wii U. Did you also know that Nintendo have made several prototype pieces of hardware that never found their way to market? For a whole bunch of facts about lost Nintendo hardware, check out the video on screen. Who's that peeking in my window? Ah, uh, you should let some more skin show. And if one of these websites get the info, we can work it out. No Nintendo.